Sometimes we serve the Lord, we'll go to church, we'll pray, and then we'll see a need and we don't want to deal with it, we'll just let someone else do it, and we make up excuses rather than getting involved. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, God. So they were showing evidence that they didn't love God, and they didn't love their neighbor as themselves. As I said this morning, we want to look together at the well-known parable of the good Samaritan. Now, the unique thing about this parable is it doesn't actually say in the text, and he spake a parable unto them. Normally, the parable says it's a parable, but this is just a parable that doesn't say it's a parable. You got that? <laughs> now, what is a parable? The word parable, which is in the Bible, comes from three Greek words, parabole, parabole, which literally means to lay alongside. So Jesus takes an earthly story and he lays it alongside a heavenly meaning. I love the definition of a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. They're always taken from real life, sometimes maybe a true story that he knows about. He said, some believe that this story of the Good Samaritan was actually took place and it was common knowledge at that time as Jesus relates it. But he lays it alongside spiritual truth. Now, like the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the Good Samaritan is often misunderstood and misinterpreted. People most often misinterpret parables because they try to read into the parable things that God never intended to be in the parable. I read a quote recently and he said, never get out of a text what is not in the text. I love that. Never take out of the text what is not in the text. So many times we want all the facets of the parable to be kind of allegorical or spiritualized or to be a typology when it's never intended to be that, that usually whatever precipitates or causes the giving of the parable is what the parable is about in its main theme and main thrust. And most parables generally have one main lesson that God wants us to learn. Now, a parable is also a window for us to see the world around us, and it's also a mirror for us to see ourselves. So we're going to look through the window and see the world around us, and then we're going to look through the, into the mirror and we see ourselves. But we find in, in this story of the Good Samaritan that it involves violence, it involves crime, it involves religious and racial discrimination, it involves hatred and neglect and loss of compassion. It sounds like we're watching the evening news, right? Sounds like a mugging in LA or a mugging in New York City, a robbery's taking place. It's just so common today to our culture and it shows you that man hasn't changed, that we still live in a very violent, uncompassionate world. Now, how appropriate for our times this story is, the Bible, I believe, is relevant. I have people say to me, you just preach the Bible? How do you make it relevant? I, I don't make the Bible relative. It is relative. It's a living, powerful word of God. So I don't make it relative. It is relative. The story also teaches us that we need to have compassion in a compassion, in an uncompassionate world. We need to love our neighbor as ourself and that we cannot separate our relationship with God from the relationship with other human beings. We cannot separate our relationship with God to our relationship with our fellow man or our neighbors. Now, there are three sections of this text I want to break down if you're following me or taking notes. The first is the priority of love, and we see the great questions, the priority of love seen in these great questions, verse 25 to 29. Follow with me as we read it. It says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? 
And how readest thou? Jesus answered his question with the question, what does the law say and how do you interpret it? And he answered and said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. Now, I want to make clear, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. So the lawyer is answering Jesus' question, how readest thou? And he quotes Deuteronomy 5, 6, which is known as the great Shemia. It's a portion of it. And then he ties in Leviticus 19, verse 18, at the end where he says, and thy neighbor as thy Self. That's Leviticus 19, verse 18. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Now, I want you to note the four questions that appear in this text. First one is in verse 25. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life. Then the second two are in verse 26, what is written in the law, Jesus asked, and how do you read, verse 26. And then the fourth question is in verse 29. He said, he went on to justify himself, he asked the question, who is my neighbor? Now, here's the key to interpreting the parables. Most of the time, not always, but 99% of the time, When a parable is given by Jesus, it's caused by some circumstance or issue or question that's asked of him. So when you always study a parable, you back up into the context, find out what caused Jesus to utter the parable. In this case, it was a series of questions. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Go back with me to verse 25. Now, this was asked by a certain lawyer. Now, this lawyer was not a civil lawyer like we have today, but he was a scribe or a theologian. So his study of the law was the law of God, the Bible. They they didn't separate their civil law from their biblical law. So he was a student of scripture. He was a theologian. He was a scholar. He knew his Bible, sometimes called a scribe. And the fact that he stood up, verse 25, indicates Jesus was most likely seated and he was teaching and when he was teaching, others were seated around him. So the rabbis would sit to teach and the people would be seated as well. So when this man stood up, it was actually a gesture that was antagonistic and somewhat hostile. If you're in the church on Sunday morning and someone stood up in the middle of the sermon, It's like, what's going on? What's what's happening here? So he stands up and he confronts Jesus with this question, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now notice it's clear in verse 25, he asked the question testing or trying to tempt Jesus. So his motive wasn't pure. He didn't really want to know the answer. He wanted to trap Jesus in his Response. He most likely wanted Jesus to say, well, disregard the law, just believe in me, and that's all you have to do. So he was going to make an issue out of the fact that Jesus maybe de- denied the law or taught something different. He was trying to trap Jesus. Now, you know that Jesus cannot be what? Trapped. Remember when they came and said, is it okay to pay taxes to Caesar? And they rubbed their hands together and we got him. We got him. If he says yes, then people will be upset with him because we hate Rome. If he says no, we'll let Rome know and they'll arrest him. Either way he goes, we got him. So they asked Jesus the question, what did he say? He said, show me a coin. Notice he didn't have one on him. I relate to Jesus. <laughs> Don't carry a lot of money. And he held up the coin, he says, whose image is on this coin? And they said, why Caesar's? And then I can see him with a little Messiah style flip back, ping. Didn't say it in the Bible, I just imagined, ping, he flipped the coin back. And he said those words, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they just all were in awe at his response. 
So this time they're trying to trick him with this question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Now notice like most people, it's assuming that I need to do something to get eternal life. Christianity says done, religion says do. Christianity says Jesus died for your sins, you believe in him, which is not a work, by the way. Faith is not a work. We're not saved by our works. It's simply trusting Christ's finished work on the cross to save me. Religion says do, Christianity says done. We sing nothing in my hand I bring, simply to his cross I cling, amen? So we don't work to be saved, but he has this concept that I need to do something to be saved, trying to trap Jesus in his answer, but it assumes that we have eternal life. Now, eternal life is not just eternal existence. You know, everyone who lives on earth will one day die, and they will still exist either in heaven or in hell. Now, I know that's a little radical, but it's true. Everyone living goes, when they die, to heaven, or they go to hell. You say, what determines where they spend eternity? Their relationship to Christ. Whether they've trusted in him or believed on him and received him as their Lord and Savior. Where you're at with God is based on where you're at with Jesus Christ. Have you trusted him who died and rose again from the dead? So what does Jesus say to this question? Verse 26, he said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? This is one of my favorite points in this whole text. You know why? Because Jesus always took questions to the Bible. We should always turn to the Bible to answer life's great question. What could be more important than how do I go to heaven when I die? How do I live in heaven and have eternal life, life with more quality? Where do we find the answer? The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, amen? So we should always be opening the Bible to answer life's perplexing questions. Whenever Jesus was asked, what does the Scripture say? What does the Bible say? Oh, the heartache, the pain, and the misery that could be spared us and the church if we would simply open our Bibles and go to the scriptures and say, what does the Lord say? What does God say about my marriage, about this relationship, about this issue? How am I to view this situation? Always open the Bible and get your answers from the word of God like Jesus did. Now he gave him Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. And then I said, Leviticus 19, verse 18, and thy neighbor as thyself. Now, the problem was this scribe would not admit he had not loved God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, and he had not loved his neighbor as himself. But he doesn't want to admit that. He wants to save face. So Jesus said unto him, thou hast answered correctly, verse 28, this do and you will live. Now, the problem is with him and with us, you can't love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind because you're a fallen sinner. And it's not really possible for you to do that in your fallen, unregenerate, unsaved state. I don't think anyone loves God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their strength, and with all their mind, and certainly we don't love our neighbor as ourself. If you live in Southern California and drive the freeways, you don't just get out and go, oh, I just love everyone on the road. I love you. I love you. Honk, honk. By the way, I hate people honking at me. Don't honk at me if you see me. Only honk if it's life or death. Amen. <laughs> but man, is it hard. I don't like that guy. I don't like that person. Or they look weird. I like that person. I, I, they, they look like me and talk like me and think like me. I like them. 
I don't really like my neighbor, I don't love my neighbor as I should. So one of the main things for this parable, listen carefully. If you miss this, you miss the meaning. It's to show us we need a Savior. I can't love God. I can't love my neighbor. I need Jesus' work on the cross in order to be forgiven of my sins and have eternal life so that we can't do to be saved. We have to trust and believe in Christ. But he's willing to justify himself. Jesus said, okay, that's great. Right answer. Spot on. Do that and you shall live, but he's willing to justify himself, verse 29. So he wanted to save face. He wanted to divert. He wanted to change the definition of neighbor. He wanted to discuss. So he's willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, let's talk about this. Who's my neighbor? You want me to love my neighbors myself? Well, just how do we define Neighbor. So he wants to get into the definition of neighbor and debate the whole issue rather than confess his sin. I've not loved and I haven't lived the way I should. So he tries to avoid, listen carefully, the real issue of his sin and failure to keep the law by proposing a theological debate. You know, this is so common today. I can't tell you how many times I've had men, and I'm going to specifically mention men, okay? Men who come to me in the church and want to discuss and debate theological issues. Usually it's eschatological. It's about prophecy and future things and the book of Revelation or what do you believe in, a mid-trib or post-trib or do you believe in all millennial or amillennialism? You know, they want to debate theological issues of the end times. And I happen to know that they aren't right with their wife. They're not loving their wife. They're not getting along in their marriage. They're, 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 they're having marriage problems right now, and they want to discuss eschatology. Not, not going to happen. You go home and love your wife as Christ loved the church. You know, people get all upset about things they don't know in the Bible. I'm more upset about things I do know <laughs> that I'm to love my wife as Christ loved the church, and I'm to be the husband God wants me to be. So don't divert, listen carefully, don't divert from your obedience to God and dealing with your own sin by debating theological issues and scripture. So he's diverting by questioning these things. Who is my neighbor? How do you really define Neighbor, And so Jesus is going to use this to teach the parable of the good Samaritan. It's important that we obey the word of God. Then God will give us more light and give us more understanding. So to the lawyer, this neighbor was just a problem to debate and discuss. Now, it moves secondly in verse 30 to 35 to a picture of love, the good Samaritan, the picture of love, the good Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, here it is, that a certain man went down from Jerusalem. Now he's giving this parable, beginning in verse 30, in response to the question, who's my neighbor? You want to know who my neighbor is? It's anyone who has a need. So a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. We'll come back to this. And he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his remnant, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Sounds like the evening news. And by chance there came down a certain priest, and he went that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was in the place, he came and he looked on him, and he passed by on the other side. And now comes the Samaritan, verse 33. A Samaritan came in his journey where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. No mention of compassion by the priest, no mention of compassion of the Levite. The Samaritan had compassion, and he had compassion on him. And verse 34, he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on him, set him on his own beast and brought him to the inn, took care of him, and took him on the morrow when he departed, 
and took two pence, verse 35, gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now notice Jesus gives the parable, as I said, in answer to the question in verse 29, who is my neighbor? So the parable is going to be teaching us who our neighbor is, and better, who we should be neighborly to. Not who's my neighbor, but who I should be neighbor to. So Jesus was giving this parable. Now go back to verse 30. It says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, this is a 17-mile journey. And from Jerusalem on the Mount of Zion down into the Jordan Valley by the Dead Sea where Jericho is, is a 17-mile, very steep, very narrow road, very windy, very treacherous. And you drop from above sea level to 3,000 feet below sea level. You drop from the mountain of Jerusalem down to the valley of the Dead Sea. So it's the lowest part on earth. It was come to be called the highway of blood, because it became notorious for robbers and thieves and people who would kill others to rob them and steal from them. And many times the priests and Levites lived in Jericho, but they served in Jerusalem, so they would have to make this treacherous, dangerous journey. Now the priests came by, first of all, this picture of this priest, and he came down that way, And he saw the man bloodied, beaten, robbed, and he passed by on the other side. Now, the priest was, again, a Levite, but also a priest from the tribe of Aaron, who was no doubt in the temple, serving the Lord, doing his priestly duty. Now, if you're beaten, robbed, and laying in the highway dead, who would be the best person to have walk up? A pastor a minister, a priest, right? So he's looking at this priest thinking, oh, oh, praise be to God, a priest. And the priest comes and the priest goes by. And a few years ago, I was, long story short, I was driving my son's 68 VW bus to get it worked on as a mechanic. And it broke down as it did almost every day. And I was up on Han Road, and I was stuck there, and I forgot my phone. So I'm standing out by the highway, and I can't tell you how many people from the church went by and said, Pastor John, (laughs) hi, and they waved and honked at me, and they just, hey, uh, help, 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 and they just went by, and they just went by, and they just went by, and I thought, Lord, thank you for that loving congregation I thought, how wonderful. I even had people come to me and say, I saw you by the road there. What was going on? I needed your help. Thanks a lot. So they probably know that. I was looking at the priest like, yeah, man of God, a man of the cloth. We're saved. There he goes. And then all of a sudden, the Levite shows up. Three guys, priest first, then a Levite. And a Levite was from the tribe of Levi, but not a priest. So they were assistants to the priests. So they worked in the temple, they worked in the synagogues, and they assisted the priests in their priestly duty. So he was coming back from no doubt ministry there in Jerusalem. And it says that he looked on him so that he saw him. And the the, the priest saw him too, verse 31. But again, he, like the priest, passed by on the other side. What a picture of lovelessness and indifference. They had religion, but they didn't have love. Now, the story doesn't say why they passed by. If you're a priest, the Bible forbids you to touch a dead body, you would become ceremonially unclean. So it may be that he justified his actions by saying, I I, I can't touch this man. I'll be unclean. I can't do my service as a priest. You know, it's interesting that Jesus said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. But this man thought, well, I can't touch him. I'll become ceremonially unclean, or it's not my fault. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. 
I'm in a hurry. I want to get home. I've been at the temple serving for days. My wife's expecting me to get home, and she's probably cooked a meal for me, and we need to, I need to get home. I don't have the time. Or I've been serving in the temple. I've done my part. I don't want to be defiled. Let someone else get involved. Sometimes we serve the Lord. We'll go to church. We'll pray. And then we'll see a need, and we don't want to deal with it. We'll just let someone else do it. And we make up excuses rather than getting involved. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, He has shown thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So they were showing evidence that they didn't love God and they didn't love their neighbor as themselves. So to the priest and the Levite, the neighbor was a nuisance to avoid. But then we have the picture of love and compassion. Verse 33 to 35, we already read it. A certain Samaritan. Now we know that Samaritans were hated and despised by the Jews. They were half Jew, half Gentile. So they were mixed race and they had a false religion. They built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. They were apostate, they were hated by the Jews, and they hated the Jews, and the Jews hated them. So Jesus makes the Samaritan, and in, in the Greek it starts with the Samaritan, the front of this text, for emphasis. So this was emphasized when Jesus was the Samaritan. And it must have blown the sandals off of everyone listening at that time. Are you kidding me? They could understand. Now, I haven't mentioned the man who was robbed and beaten laying on the highway was most likely inferred in the story, but not explicitly said, to be Jewish. But he was most likely Jewish, and that would make it even a greater me message of compassion for the Samaritan to show this compassion to a Jew. So he's laying there. Now, they would have thought, well, maybe another Jew would help the Jew, but no, the Levite, the priest do not but a Samaritan, the despised enemy of the Jews. So when he came, he came where the man was, verse 33, saw him, had compassion, went to him, poured oil and wine in his wounds as for medicinal purposes. No doubt he didn't have an emergency kit and he had to take his shirt off and tear his shirt into cloths to bandage him up. And on the next day when he departed the inn, he gave the innkeeper two pence. Now, a pence is a denarii. It's a silver coin. You would work one day for one pence, so it's two days' salary that he gave to the innkeeper and said, whatever thou spendest more when I come back, I will repay thee. Now, our Christian love is to transcend race, religion, and nationality. Jesus said we should love even our enemies. All men are not God's children by regeneration, but they are by creation. Every human being is created in the image of God. So love for others is evidence of my love of, or of my salvation. Now, I want to point out five marks of loving your neighbor, five things involved in loving your neighbor. Number one is compassion. Notice that in verse 33. He saw him, and he had compassion. I found it interesting that the word compassion is used primarily, almost exclusively, for Jesus Christ in the New Testament. It's found in a couple of parables where we have the father, compassion toward his prodigal son, which actually is a picture of the love of God, but the word compassion is used primarily for Jesus Christ. It's used in the epistles as the fruit of the Spirit, but the word compassion means simply to feel others' pain inwardly. It's your pain in my heart. It's sympathy or to empathize. It's feeling someone else's pain. So this compassion, someone said pity weeps and walks away, compassion comes to help and stay. When we pity someone, 
we just walk by them. When we have compassion, we feel their pain and it moves us to take action. Someone said, you are never more Christ-like than when you feel another's hurt and seek to help. You're never more like Jesus Christ when you feel someone else's hurt and you seek to help. I love that statement, in every pain that rends the heart, the man of sorrows has a part. Jesus feels our pain, we should feel our pain with others. We should have the pain in our heart. That, it literally means to have pains in your inward feelings of your stomach, to care for them. So Jesus had compassion, so should we. Secondly, he had contact. Look, look at verse 34. It says he went to him. He didn't run from him. He didn't cross the other side of the road. You know, the road was very narrow at that time, it's believed. They probably had to step over this man and kind of try to avoid him. But this man went to him. We need to make contact with sinners. We're always trying to avoid needy people, hurting people, suffering people, people we don't care for. Jesus was attracted to them and went to them to care. If there was a crowd, whoever had the greatest need was always the focus of attention for Jesus. He made contact. Thirdly, he cared for him. I love it, verse 34, took care of him. And then fourthly, it cost him something, verse 35. It cost him two denarii at the end, cost him time, cost him energy, cost him effort. He had to put him on his donkey, had to take him to the inn, had to take his oil, had to take his wine, probably olive oil, and he would pour that on. They would pour the wine for municipal purposes. And it cost him something. So many times we avoid compassion because we don't want to pay the price. But the blessing of being compassionate and helping far outweighs avoiding helping others. And then the courage, I added that, number five. You know, it must have taken a lot of courage for this man, a Samaritan, to put a Jew beat up, bloodied, robbed on his donkey and have people not think, are you guilty of this crime? He put a Jew on his donkey, comes into town with this man. It took courage. So you have the priority of love, the picture of love in the Samaritan. And then the wrap-up is verse 36 and 37, the practice of love, the great command. So now, these three, thinkest thou, which now these three, verse 36, excuse me, was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves. Now, I want you to note how Jesus rephrases the question. The lawyer said, who's my neighbor? Jesus said, who was neighborly? Who was neighbor to him? Not who's your neighbor, but who can I be a neighbor to? So he says, who is neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Question mark. And he said, he that showed mercy. Now notice he doesn't want to use the word Samaritan. He didn't say, oh, that's Samaritan. He said, no, you know, uh, that, that guy that showed mercy. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. God's grace is giving us what we don't deserve. So he showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, notice it, go and do thou likewise. So you do this and you shall have go and do thou likewise. This was the command. But the point that Jesus made is it's not who's my neighbor, but who can I be a neighbor to? You know what the answer is? Anyone who is in need. Well, he's a different race. He's a different religion. He's in a different rank of life or status. I, I, I can't, can't help that person. No. Anyone in need is my neighbor. That's the point. So what we should do, we should love God with all our heart, soul strength, but in our own strength and our own ability, 
we fall short, we're sinful, then we should love our neighbor, but we don't love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So important. You know, it's been said, people will never care how much you know until they know how much you care. They'll never care how much you know until they know how much you care. So we learn from this parable that we should love God and love our neighbor. The lawyer saw the neighbor as a problem to just theologically discuss. The priest and Levite saw him as a nuisance to avoid, but the Samaritan was neighbor and served him and helped him. But the point of the parable is we all fall short. What can I do to inherit eternal life? Believe in Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's not the labor of my hands that can fulfill the law's demands. Thou must save and thou alone. We know that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. So don't leave here today thinking, oh, okay, I got to be a good, good Samaritan. You know that we have, we have good Samaritan laws in the United States? We actually have good Samaritan laws in many of the states. If you see somebody that needs help and you don't help them, you can be lying. And, and, and many of the good Samaritan laws, if you don't at least call 911 for help, you, you could be in trouble if someone's in need. But that's not what's going to get you to heaven. That's not going to get you through the pearly gates. What gets you to heaven is believing in Jesus Christ. We all sin. We've all fallen short. There's no one righteous, no, not one. And by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. But by grace, you have been saved through faith. And salvation is not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, that's your great need. Let's pray.